we because we have an audience across the the U.S. I think it's important that we we provide information for everyone, and you can stretch my little solid, my little hard head at times. So, uh, so yeah, we're we're at. I have I have I have uh, two central, three eastern. Uh, yeah, ready so to I, roll. Yeah, so I I think we'll we'll get started. Gosh, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the. The, the August version of the Soil Health Nexus Digital Cafe. I'm Paul Gross, an extension educator in, in Central Michigan, part of the uh, Soil Health Nexus, uh, along with Christina Carell, and Nardi, uh, Sarah Fransack, our help coordinate behind the scenes here. And we're really happy today to have uh, Anthony Hartshorn with us to, to present. Uh, for those who are new to the Soil Health Nexus, uh, we're a group of university-led uh, individuals uh, really focused and dedicated on increasing knowledge and education for extension uh, and uh, agency personnel provided those resource research-based resources. Uh, we were part of the North Central region, the 12 uh, land-grant universities. Format today is uh, we're gonna have the presentation uh, followed by Q&A, then we can go into break rooms. You can choose a break room. I'd encourage everyone right from the start to put your questions within the in the chat and uh, Tony will answer them as, uh, as after he finishes up with his presentation. So so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and, and welcome Tony. If you could share your screen, now we're really excited to have you. Can you see that okay? Hopefully yes, we're good. Be a screen. Um, <clears throat> well, Paul et al., like I, I know it takes a village to pull these off. I am uh, very, very flattered uh, by your invitation. So um, the title is How to Interrogate the Soil. Um, I love it that you guys are looking a little bit upstream out of your 12 state area. And I will just sort of note that I am professionally jealous. I can only wish for a day when we might have a similar set of Northern Rocky Mountain states that sort of come together to exactly have these kinds of conversations. So my structure is I hope to sort of get through a slide deck in about 25 minutes and then we'll open it up as Paul said for Q&A. I do wanna warn everyone who's on the call, I have no idea how many is here, maybe it's 20 or something. Like you need to know how to chat because I'm gonna pop quiz you in a couple slides just to sort of see where we're at, okay? Um, just, you know, kind of get the ball rolling. And I'm trying to, there we go. So the real reason I'm excited to be here is that I am not a regenerative ag speaker. I am one of these boring university speakers. And so I'm extra flattered, right? You could have had a really cool regenerative ag speaker. This is not my memeified slide. You have to get on Twitter and follow Soils Diva um, to find the source, but I think that this is perfect. And so I often, uh, you know, I was just telling a friend of mine, I was out in the field this morning, I have professional jealousy towards regenerative ag speakers. Why do they get all these like uh, digital cafe opportunities? So again, thank you. I'm, I'm flattered. Okay. So I'm gonna give you the world's fastest bio sketch. I was uh, raised in Costa Rica, and then I did this crazy North American odyssey, which involved these states, New Hampshire, Alaska, California, Alaska, California, Arizona, Virginia, Montana. Um, that's important because of my next two slides, which are basically related to, to Costa Rica, and those sort of serve this broader theme of how to interrogate a soil. Um, Obviously, I've made this mistake before. Before we get to how to interrogate a soil, I think it's always interesting to answer the question, why should we interrogate soils? And I'll give you four reasons why I think we should interrogate soils, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, but, but remember, if you've never found the chat functions, move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and you should see or figure out a way that, oh no, on mine it's the top of the screen, and you'll see a little icon that says chat. I'm gonna want you to type in a number into the chat, okay? So that's coming up. I Don't say I didn't warn you. Okay, so um, this is a very, very famous uh, political cartoon. Shows this sort of Hawaiian shirted dude in his Cadillac representing developed countries. Hey, yo amigo, we need that tree to protect us from the greenhouse effect. And I remember seeing this, you know, when I was growing up uh, in Costa Rica um, it was from 1989, so I was already in college by 89. But I mean, there's this really interesting idea that's represented in this cartoon, which is that that tree on the left 
is scrubbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, and then meanwhile, the vehicle on the right, of course, is emitting carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, of course, um, you know, back to that atmosphere. And I'll come back to those two arrows, but I'd really like you to sort of lock in on that conceptually. And I just wanted to show you some of the images that are coming out that are related to soil health. This is a poster in Spanish talking about live fencing and its potential value for biodiversity. Um, just an example of some of the work that folks are doing in places that are far more tropical than either your states or definitely my states. And then I love this image. I follow a group on Facebook called Low Carbon Cattle. And uh, their Facebook group likes to argue that, hey, guess what? Livestock, that's the word ganaderia um, in Costa Rica is different. And so, you know, what they're really trying for is what is, how, how can we manage livestock even in the tropics? Um, to have sort of improved soil health outcomes. So just as an FYI, that's the Costa Rican flag right there. All right, so that was like the world's fastest biosketch. Um, why should we interrogate soils? Again, I'm gonna try to give you four reasons. Um, the first one is that I am a little bit biased, but I'm just like, well, the reason you should interrogate soils is because they're so interesting, right? They lie at this crazy Venn diagram intersection of the biosphere, the lithosphere, the atmosphere and the hydrosphere, right? That's that sort of magic um, secret spot in the middle. That's soils right there. And of course, the reason I like this representation of where everything comes together that we understand is that it can be very easily remembered because these letters, first letters spell B-L-A-H or blah. And for most people, holy cow, soils are super boring. So I kind of want to fight that. So that's one reason to interrogate soils. Number two, I probably don't need to teach this crew that's uh, on this call that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 50% higher than it was 200 years ago, right? Well, you know, we can all pat ourselves on the back for that because that's what humans have done is we've added carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. I'll come back to that because you'll see there's a certain carbon theme uh, for this presentation. Uh, just a couple months ago, um, this is a kid from the Midwest. His name's Chad Pagracki. He was CNN's Hero of the Year in 2013. So he was, a, he was a speaker here at Montana State University. And he's really been big on sort of the Mississippi River cleanup. And, and he has this great quote that the garbage got into the water one piece at a time. So don't be discouraged. Sure, there's a lot of garbage out there, but that's the way that it's going to come out, right? That's the way you clean up a river. And I mean, one of the things that I asked Chad when he was here on campus was, well, what do you do when your pollution is invisible, like carbon dioxide, right? That makes it a little bit trickier, but I think his model maybe still applies, right? That maybe we wanna be scrubbing one molecule of CO2 out of the air at a time. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, you know, what does soils have to do with atmospheric cleanup? I mean, that's really the trick, right? So these, I hope you can see three profiles in front of you. These profiles represent accumulations of what started as atmospheric carbon dioxide. Plants, green plants photosynthesize. They leak, you know, exudate sugars, carbon, essentially donuts into the soil profile. And of course, that darkens the surfaces of those soils. Um, and so let's get ready for our free quiz where you're gonna type something into the chat and then Paul, you're gonna yell at people if they don't follow the prompt. But this is a simplified carbon cycle. Um, I want you to understand that here at Montana State, we like to keep things simple. And so every year, the oceans exchange 80 billion tons or gigatons of carbon with the atmosphere. That means they burp out carbon and then they take carbon back up, right? Because they're things that photosynthesize in the oceans and then also gases dissolve in liquid water, right? So that's an exchange of 80 billion tons every year of carbon. Land is a little bit of a bigger set of arrows, but they're mostly in balance, right? 120 billion tons out. So that's soils and plants respiring carbon back to the atmosphere. But then also that big red arrow here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, but this arrow right here represents photosynthetic drawdown um, of atmospheric carbon back to land-based plants. So the free quiz, and it's coming up on this next slide, is how much do humans contribute? And, and I'll spell this out for you, but, but, but Paul will yell at you if nobody types anything into the into the um, chat, right? So here's the question and, and the prompt. 
So um, humans add carbon to our atmosphere every year. If you don't believe me, we can talk about that in the Q&A. If oceans and land add 80 and 120 billion tons of carbon a year, respectively, how much do humans add? And so what we want you to type in the chat are, are one of these answers. So you'd say ones, tens, hundo, thous, or not, N-O-T-A-S, right? So this is a slide repurposed um, from poll that I give my students and I see I've got seven responses. So if you're confused, try messaging someone privately since there's 62 participants. I think what I'm gonna do is wait until we get to maybe, well, Paul is adding all these up because, and Sarah, they're, they're adding all these up, but I'll get to maybe half of the audience, 31 votes. And then you're locked. You know, you don't get to change your answer. So I'm just sort of trying to understand if you guys understand um, how much carbon humans are responsible for, right? So we call those anthropogenic carbon emissions to the atmosphere. Hmm. There we go. There's the magic number 31. And maybe I'll wait another couple seconds. Uh, let's see if we can get to 40. Now I'm really up in it. We get two thirds of the votes. Hey, Paul, how, what are your bets that uh, a lot of people jumped on the call and they're like, oh, I can't understand a thing this guy is saying. So they already walked away for their first coffee break. All right, we're going to stop there. 35. Good. If, if, and, and we can look at the chat later. Um, or, or should I look at the chat, Paul? What's your recommendation? Why don't you look at the chat? It would be we've we've got quite a few responses. Me looking at the chat. But I've got a lot of none of the above. I'm seeing one that says uh, a thousand. I'm trying to scroll up just so that you know. Thousand, thousand, thousand. A lot thousand. of hundos. Thousand is the most popular answer. Okay, so I've seen enough of this business. Let's get to the answer. So the answer is ten, right? So so humans are broadly responsible for adding ten billion tons of carbon every year. It's only 10. It's a relatively small number. I think most people are surprised by that. At least folks on this call should be surprised by that because you voted 1,000, right? So we're 100 times lower. So the big deal, if I'm teaching the carbon cycle in six arrows, right? Ocean is two arrows up and down 80 billion tons. Land is two arrows up and down 120 billion tons. Then there's the fifth arrow, fossil fuel and land use change adds 10 billion tons of carbon every year. I mean, I'm an aggressive rounder. And then the sixth arrow is this question mark, right? So how much will we scrub out of the air? So the reason that we should be interrogating the soil is that if we can just tweak a little bit of this 120 billion ton drawdown, you guys see how that ends up being a huge fraction of the total fossil fuel and land use carbon emissions every year. Anyway, if you don't, then, then bug me on the, on the Q&A. And so this has led some groups, uh, I apologize for that. So some groups are, are saying, hey, you know, it's nice if you wanna get your fossil carbon emissions to net zero. So there's a lot of talk about net zero. Um, I'll just focus on the last highlighted line here. The only proven way to remove carbon from the atmosphere to use land to do so by growing billions of trees and storing carbon in trees and soils, right? And so that's a this is a fairly prominent group. And so I actually bought this logo, and and you'll see why I'm giving you this little logo in the green circle shortly. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody understands why an interrogate soil is that maybe if we can just goose these soils through our management practices. Obviously, this is different from corn and soybeans. I hope you can see that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about this project, but if we just goose those soils into holding on at a little bit more carbon, then that could be part of the solution, which would be really awesome. And so uh, facetious answer number three to why we should interrogate soils is because we're actually being paid by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, NRCS. We actually, last fall, a collaboration um, that I was a part of got received a conservation innovation grant on farm trial, what they call soil health demonstration trial. So this is just a little screenshot from an, uh, an onboarding session that happened earlier um, this year. And then the, the fourth reason is that we just passed this country and then the president just signed into law uh, something called the Inflation Reduction Act, right? And in that Inflation Reduction Act, there's only $25 billion uh, of money 
that are going to go to farmers, like in your 12 state region, um, to fight climate change, right? So um, I love this, this title, right? Can farmers fight climate change? Well, here are 25 billion reasons um, for us to figure out. And I'm just going to draw your attention to this quote. You guys might have heard of Christine Morgan. She's the scientific director of the Soil Health Institute, quoted in this article. And she says, you know, grab a shovel and jump on it. Uh, the shovel goes deeper, you know, if you've added carbon to your soil. And so the question I'd have this group ponder as we transition into how to interrogate a soil is, yeah, but how much deeper does that shovel go? And can we measure that increased, you know, sort of thickness of an O or an A horizon robustly? And you'll see that's sort of a, a theme for today's talk. Okay, how to interrogate a soil. I do want you to understand, all my students already know this. This is like the Tony edition of how to interrogate soils. Like there are many, there are thousands of ways to interrogate soils. Uh, this is just one of them. Um, I do want to give credit where credit is due, like this uh, soil health demonstration trial is up on the Blackfeet Nation. I'll provide you with a map next, uh, coming up in a couple of slides. Um, this grant was led effort by the Pecani Lodge Health Institute, so that's based in the Blackfeet Nation. Uh, that's in north, northern uh, Montana. I'll show you where that's from, uh, sort of headwaters of, of the Missouri River is one way to think about it. Um, and that was in collaboration with Western Sustainability Exchange and the National Center for Appropriate Technology, both of which are based in, in Montana. So in my world, like how to do this, and I'll use a bunch of slides prepared by an undergrad research assistant, Jaden. I've got her in a photo coming up. So you got to have crew, like you got to have bodies, right? So I'll show you in the next slide some of our bodies. Um, uh, you got to have maps, you got to have some agency guidance, uh, you got to have some equipment, of course, like shovels, right? So I'll step you through that pretty quickly. And I just wanted to call attention to the motto of the Pecani Lodge Health Institute, right? So their motto is connecting our people with research, health, and well-being. And I love the re resonance of connecting our people with sort of your own sort of, you know, north central region water networks mission, which is sort of increasing connectivity between all these partners. So I saw some resonance there. All right. Just a quick look at the at the crew and a, and a first look at the landscape. So this is a glaciated zone. I actually have no idea where the top of the glacier was. This would have been a mountain glacier 20,000 years ago at, at, at last glacial maximum. And then you can sort of see Mary Jane Lake in the back. And I'll just talk about like sort of our general approach to sampling these the, this this reservation, right? It's it's 1.5 million acres. Just to get you oriented, um, this is what the reservation looks like, that center figure right in here. Um, off to the west, this western border of the reservation is Glacier National Park. And I don't know if you guys get out to national parks much. This is one of my favorite entrances to a national park because A, it's free. There's no booth, like right where you cross into the park. This is a dirt road. And, um, you know, I think about 20 people drive this access. So little known thing. This is uh, the access to Cut Bank campground. And then we're about four or five uh, hours south. So I'm here in Bozeman, Montana State University, the other MSU, <laughs> since I understand there's some Michigan State people on the call. And then, uh, you know, Chicago is like 1500 miles off to the east. Um, this is what it looks like on the ground in the reservation. So those peaks are all in Glacier National Park. Okay. Um, a little bit more on the reservation. I found this beautiful soils map. It's from 1969. And so the general idea on this soils map is that of course the soils that are right up against Glacier National Park are wetter because we're looking at a climate and elevational gradient. You've got intermediately wet soils. And then here we're starting almost getting down into short grass prairie right by the, by the edge of the reservation there. And I wanted to highlight this. There's actually a really nice cross section at the bottom of that soils map sort of showing chief mountain 9,000 feet in elevation that's that's super important religiously uh and sort of culturally to the blackfeet nation um so that chief mountain is over here on the left i'll just sort of circle it and then obviously parent materials change from west to east but the main difference across this enormous landscape again missouri river headwaters here um, because both the Milk River and the Cut Bank Creek are tributaries to what eventually becomes the Missouri River. Um, this is a raid across all these different sort of dominant soil series, just to sort of keep it real with, you know, the fact that we give our soil series real names. Um, this is some of the agency guidance, and I figured some of you might be interested in this. Uh, so, okay, you know, you got a soil health demonstration trial. What, what are you on the hook for exactly? So then you want to Google NRCS soil 
and then this magic number 216 it's a it's a technical document um but it basically says soil health demonstration trial minimum data sets for environmental financial and social data and so they've got a really nice set of guidance there and then one of the words that i was unfamiliar with before we got this grant is this idea of a conservation evaluation and monitoring activity so that's a little inset that i've got in the right um, that becomes a little bit clearer here. Just know that the NRCS used to call, uh, have what they call conservation management units. So, you know, how many samples do you need? Well, they're arguing let's do about five, four samples, you know, per conservation management unit. For this project specifically that I'll be telling you a little bit more about, I mean, I don't have that much time. Um, we're transitioning to what the NRCS now calls a soil health management unit. So, on each of our 10 producers' ranches, um, these are on the Blackfeet Nation, we're gonna be trying to identify soil health management units. So we're gonna be trying to characterize in a baseline sense what the soils are, what their properties are, bring in a management intervention or an amendment or the combination thereof. And then over the course of the next five years, we're just getting going. Um, ask the question, you know, were these practices able to move the needle in terms of soil health? And this would be a great place for me to pause for a second, take a little bit of water, and then take you on a quick virtual field trip to East Africa. Um, and this is going back about 90 years. So this concept of thinking about how the soils differ from higher locations in a landscape, and this is like a granitic outcrop um, that I'm sort of circling right here, down towards a riparian zone, obviously the soil properties differ depending on where you are in the hill slope. And so the technical term for that is a catena. And that word was coined by Jeffrey Milne um, back in the 30s and 40s. I mean, he got an article into, um, into Nature in 1936, but it, then he sort of credited this other article, 1947, sort of formalizing this term. And this has really been the approach that we are bringing to the Blackfeet Nation is, let's identify some catenas. So we'll sample on the crest. That's again, this little outcrop in the center of your image. And then we're gonna go down and do maybe a shoulder position and then a side slow position and then a foot slow position and then a toe slow position. And we expect differences because this is essentially what some people also call a hydro sequence, right? You should end up with wetter uh, materials, but in some cases your particle size changes. So maybe you're rocky high in the landscape and then clay you're down low. And just as a visual representation, we brought this same approach to characterizing a farm near Bozeman, wasn't on the Blackfeet Nation earlier this summer in June, where you know we characterize the soils on the crest, so that's the image on your left. We characterize them on a river terrace, sort of in an intermediate elevation, that's the farm uh, that was growing some organic vegetables. And then finally down in the riparian quarter, you can see if your eyes are really, really good, I apologize for the quality here, like some reductive reduction in oxidation or what we call redoxymorphic features down where the soils are wettest. So bringing it back to the Blackfeet Nation, you know, uh, the lowest point here, I'm going to try to circle it for you. That's our crest position. And then you can hopefully see there's a drainage running through here. This is called Depot Creek. Um, this is called Blackfeet Community College, the Blackfeet Nation's tribal college. And so I'm working with some of those interns. I showed you them earlier. Um, and so what we do is we basically characterize the soils from crest down to the riparian corridor and trying to answer this question, well, what are some representative units of the landscape and how do those soil properties change from crest to riparian areas? So, of course, when you're digging in rocky soils, you know, recently glaciated soils, um, you got to have some muscle. So our interns provide the muscle. And I just wanted to get you some overviews of some of the gorgeous scenery up on this uh, uh, I know it's different from what you're used to because you're not growing corn and soybeans up here. Obviously, we're pulling the samples out of the pit. We sample by horizons, uh, lay the samples out to dry, uh, and then no one will catch this reference. But then we do, instead of a cook, we do a bake. Um, and that involves just a drying oven. In this case, we're looking at some crucibles and then some soil on the left on that pan. It's an old pizza pan we stole from the student union. Uh, anyway, we like to dry in the pizza pan and then throw that into a mortar or pestle. Um, then, you know, our standard method for one of the, some of the data that I'll be showing you is to pop it into a programmable furnace. And then we like to burn our samples at 360 degrees centigrade for two hours. And we use that as an index that's loss on ignition um, to index organic matter. 
a um, little bit of a trick slide here, you know, other things you can do with a furnace, you can actually burn off the soil inorganic carbon. So we have a lot of carbon salts in our soil. So you might know that more like calcium carbonate. So sometimes we wanna get rid of that as well. And of course what's left is what's shown on the right here. If you boil off, if you burn off the organic carbon, so think organic matter, and you burn off the inorganic carbon, your soils turn from our pleasant, normal looking browns and they all in general, I mean, there's some exceptions that I've experienced turn red. And that's just because you haven't burnt off the iron that is sort of left behind in the soil. And in this case, you know, that iron serves as a soil color bully. Uh, this is Jaden Hart at work. Uh, she pulled this slide together originally to give a presentation up at Blackfeet Community College. But, uh, you know, so we, we not only do loss on ignition, but we also have a combustion analyzer that involves sort of wrapping very, very small samples. I mean, you have no idea unless you've done it. 30 milligram samples, that's very small, like 1 30th of a paper clip of weight. And then you put them into silver capsules. And then because we're interested in getting rid of the inorganic carbon, we add acid. So we do that, we call educationally approved dropping of acid. That's what Jaden's doing in front of you. And uh, of course the carbonate fizzes, effervesces. And I think she was really modest because this is her original slide. And then I had to edit it because in some cases there's so much carbonate in our Montana soils that she actually had to add 12 shots of concentrated acid. And then, you know, following with two, uh, two, two rinses. And then of course we use a combustion analyzer. These are sort of a dime a dozen in universities. Um, and this was really to just have a way for us to understand where our soil organic matter estimates by loss on ignition, um, were those pretty close to what you'd expect for soil organic carbon? Uh, so here's, you know, my one data slide. I'm gonna check the time. Whoo, 27 minutes in. Um, so the the point of this slide, you don't have to read the tiny print. It's all there. Um, I've got on the x-axis the percent soil organic carbon. So again, that's with the little capsules and the combustion. And this is after we've added acid. And you can see those values range between zero and 10%. I've, I'm plotting 43 data points. So each of those data points represents three capsules that Jaden laboriously acidified, right? Um, but they also represent three triplicates that we also burned in a beaker, usually for loss on ignition as organic matter. And you can see on the y-axis, those values run from about zero up to 20%. And I think one of the things that I love about this data set that just, we just cranked this out a couple of weeks ago is that in general, if you were given a soil organic matter number, and let's call it 10%, at least for these soils, you could be pretty close if you estimated your soil organic carbon. So remember that's the dark soil color bully that makes the tops of, uh, of, of soils dark. Um, you'd be really close if you just divided that 10% organic matter by two and you ended up at 5% soil organic carbon, right? Because our slope of our line is 2.03. And for me, I would say, you know, that's pretty good for government work because that's definitely how I ask my students um, to go from organic matter to organic carbon is divide by two. Um, here, I'm just gonna plot some of the data um, and run through it really quickly. There's a lot of data on here, but this is our transect running from Crest at the bottom to this uh, Depot Creek, the Creekside sample point at the top. Those organic matter numbers, just looking at the surface, run from about 10%, 6%, 37% at that intermediate shrub location, 15%, and then down to 4%. I'm just highlighting like the tops of those soil profiles that we sampled each one, the interns, um, by Horizon. And I just wanna highlight this 37%, like that's pretty high. And so, you know, I have a theory on why that's going on, but um, in general, I think what's going on is that we're trapping a lot of snow in that location. Then the shrubbery is also providing shade to that location. And that 37% is associated with what we called in the field an O horizon, right? So, you know, dominated by organic material. So consistent with our measurements. And then, you know, we do do some math. Um, the way to do volumetric soil organic carbon is to do what I just showed you, which is measure on a mass basis, what's your soil organic carbon, got to multiply by density. If you don't do that, in my book, that's a total party foul. Um, you got to multiply by the fraction of that hole or horizon that you sample that's not rock, because we only want to talk about soil. Um, and then you got to finally, you know, multiply it by the thickness of the soil. And those get you units that are comparable, if you speak freedom units, tons per acre. 
right? Um, in my little box here, you know, we could say grams of carbon per square centimeter of soil, but, those, but dimensionally those are akin to tons per acre. And then what you can do is just add up those different slices of soil worth of carbon, and then you'd have an estimate of volumetric estimate of soil organic carbon, super important. And so, you know, if we're coming back here, uh, I showed you this slide already, and we're really interested in, well, are these practices going to, you know, measurably, change the amount of organic matter and organic carbon, one of the things that we have the interns do, and I'll show you these data next, is they all go to the same exact hole, and we ask them, how thick is the O horizon? How thick do you think the A horizon? Again, you've got, we had seven interns this summer, like seven sets of eyeballs on one soil. And that's really an important question, right? I showed you mathematically how that fits into the equation. How thick is the O or the A? So here are their data, right? So on the left is just a screenshot of our data notebook. And what I want you to see is for one soil, those estimates range from zero to two where my cursor is, zero to eight. That guy was like a, a lumper, I guess, uh, or gal. Zero to three, one to four, because she was calling out an O horizon apparently, zero to five, zero to three. So I can throw all those numbers in a spreadsheet and, and the interns average about four inches, right, for the thickness of the A horizon then. And then what I really want to draw your attention to is the standard deviation, meaning a measure of the variability of that estimate. And that standard deviation was two inches, right? So if you take the standard deviation divided by the average, you get a number of about 50%, right? In this case, 51%. That's the coefficient of variation. Highly variable estimates. So I'm going to argue in this talk that maybe one of the most important measures we can take is a robust calibrated measure of the thickness of the A horizon, right? I mean, we talked a little bit about lab equipment and all the fancy stuff you can do with your soil sample, what's in a Ziploc, but I'm almost wondering if like an important crucial step that people are skipping is sort of how thick is that A horizon? And can you get your coefficient of variation down lower? I'll pause for a second. So to put those numbers in context, you know, we're pretty lucky because this huge group, I want to say like 80 authors, just came out with a paper called Evaluation of Soil Carbon Indicators. That was just published in Soil Biology and Biochemistry. And they looked at six indicators. So from top on the y-axis, you know, beta glucosidase, that's the index enzyme activity, a four-day incubation of the soil, one-day incubation of the soil, water extractable organic carbon, permanganate oxidizable carbon, and then finally, soil organic carbon, which I've been talking about a little bit. And then what I did is just with green circles and red circles highlighted because the x-axis is the coefficient of variation. Again, that standard deviation divided by the average. And what I hope you can see is that across, they had a lot of, of data, you know, this meta-analysis. Most of their coefficients of variation were really low, like well below 25% would have been their median coefficient of variation. But there were some high flyers, right, on the on the beta glucosidase enzyme activity, and then this one day incubation. So just to contextualize, remember, our number uh, from this one sort of calibration pit that we did was we had a coefficient of variation just on the thickness of the A horizon of, of more than 50%. And then I don't know if you guys are familiar with, uh, you know, this uh, GIF. Um, hopefully it's working for you, but it might not be. But it basically argues that, okay, with good, cheap, and fast, like you can only ever pick two of those, right? And so I put this in front of my students all the time. And I'm like, okay, go ahead, pick two. Which two are you going to pick? And I'm, and I'm a little bit uh, of an evangelist on this. I'm like, it's super easy, right? You've got to pick cheap and fast. And this is in the context of soil carbon indicators or really soil health indicators, right? And the reason that I would argue this for my students at least is, well, you want inexpensive, then you can do a lot of these tests. You want it to be fast, so at least you get the answers quickly. And by the way, if it's not so good, if it's trash, as my 17 year old would say, like at least you didn't spend a lot of money on that analysis oh, or turnaround time, right? So at least you found out quickly that it was rubbish, uh, maybe to be a little bit more polite. Um, I, I'm going to skip this slide. We can come back to it. But this Lipson went into really nitty gritty in terms of how different soil health management practices uh, might be picked up or not by these six carbon indicators. So I'll just skip that for now. 
Um, I do want to, you know, sort of start closing out this sort of formal presentation and then go transition to the Q&A. By just coming back to this, this slide, I've already introduced it. I gave you my graphic and, and, and help you understand that, you know, there are a lot of people who think that they've figured out how to help us pull more carbon out of the air, right? And this, this quote was really saying, look, you got to grow trees. Well, that's kind of easier in some places where it rains than it is in other places. Like most of the images that I showed you were savanna, right? Grasslands or rangelands. And the reason I came up with that icon is that there's a professor across the pond, University of Exeter, his name's James Dyke. And uh, he has this great quote. It's astonishing how the continual absence of any credible carbon removal technology seems to never affect net zero enthusiasm. Whatever's thrown at it, net zero carries on without a dent in the fender. I've now realized that we have all been subject to a form of gaslighting, whether it's bioenergy and carbon capture and sequestration, afforestation, that's the growing trees, direct air capture like they're doing in Iceland, or carbon absorbing unicorns. The assumption is that net zero will work because it has to work. But beyond fine words and glossy brochures, there's nothing there. The emperor has no clothes. So, you know, that sort of helped me understand that, you know, I'm not alone in wondering, maybe we should be a little more skeptical about all of this money. It's a lot of money that's being thrown at quote unquote climate smart agriculture. And so I've now deputized my students with this puppy slide. My wife didn't understand it at first. She was told my kids, well, yeah, dad's over there looking at puppy photos. Anyway, um, I, I'm a mnemonic device kind of guy. And so I was never going to remember um, the criteria that I have now deputized my students to ask politely of anybody that brings up the word soil carbon sequestration. It goes by Alpo. So the A is for additionality. Like, is your producer doing something different that they wouldn't have already done? Okay, that's additional. Um, is there leakage from the project? In other words, maybe yields are lower where you're building your carbon, but because the yields are lower, all your neighbors, all 40 of your neighbors are basically leaking more carbon dioxide of the atmosphere with their sort of non-climate smart ag. Um, permanence is really a, an Achilles heel for, for soil, right? There's no form of soil carbon that I know of. Um, in fact, there's no form of carbon like diamonds that lasts forever. Otherwise, we would be up to our necks in diamonds, and, and that's not happening, right? So, you know, the way that I teach it is that not one molecule of soil organic matter, um, you know, and there are many, many, many different forms of organic matter has been shown to last forever, right? Or, or even last for a thousand years. So that's a little bit of an issue. And then the O is not really an O in ALPO. It, it's a zero. It's like, hey, can you do soil carbon math? Which is complicated and I don't have time to get into it today. So anyway, I, we might wanna look skeptically at, at programs that are promoting what, you know, Professor Dyke calls carbon absorbing unicorns. And then this article came out yesterday uh, in the New York Times, every dollar spent on this climate technology, and they're referring to carbon capture and sequestration is a waste. And, and poignantly, they argue, when we began a startup 14 years ago, so these are two dudes, one's a professor, engineering professor at MIT, and the other's the CEO of this Cobold Metals. They were the first privately funded company to make use of CCS in the United States. The idea was that the technology could compete as a way to produce carbon-free electricity by capturing the carbon dioxide emissions emitted from power plants and burying them. And now they've argued, but every dollar you spend on this is a dollar that you're not spending on renewable energy. And maybe you're part of the problem and not part of the solution. So Paul, this is where I get to tell you like pointedly, thanks again for inviting me as a university speaker, because I know we can sometimes be a little bit of a Debbie Downer, but I'll try to close out on like sort of a more optimistic note. So I have met this crazy organic farmer. His name's Bob Quinn. There's a book out that you can read about him. It's a great book called Grain by Grain. It's pictured on the right there. And Bob gives tours. He's very generous with his time. And one of the things that he showed us on a tour last week is that he's figured out a way to get his tractor to run on vegetable oil. The only trick is he has to start it with diesel and then run it on vegetable oil and then stop it on diesel, right? So he's got to have a little switcheroo on the fuel lines. He needs a second tank. But I think the thing that I wanted to impress on your group, right, your 12 state group, all 60 of you guys, is that the diesel engine was invented by Rudolf Diesel who powered it with peanut oil. 
So maybe the more things change, the more things stay the same. Like, I mean, here's, here's you know, Bob Quinn, the farmer, whatever it is, 125 years after Rudolph Diesel invents a, a peanut oil driven engine um, and he's running, you know, straight up vegetable oil, which by the way, I call fresh fuel. That is not fossil fuel, are you with me? Um, and then you don't have to go very far on Facebook, but you have all these conspiracy theories out there. This is one of my favorite. If you Google lefties and John Deere, you know, some farmer got called by a John Deere rep supposedly, and they were like, hey, you got to move all your equipment from petro diesel to electric. And the dude's like, what are you talking about? Do you not know anything about growing corn? I need to run my machines 10 to 12 days straight, 24 hours a day. How exactly does recharging the batteries work in that case? You know, and so anyway, Snopes is sort of John Deere is this about it. Um, I want to really close with, you know, just thinking about this fresh fuel and fossil fuel. I think it's hard to do this cleanup, this atmospheric cleanup, because I want you to recognize both molecules, like his vegetable oil emissions of CO2 or his petro diesel emissions of, of CO2. They're both invisible. It's not as easy as picking up like an old car, right? If you've got the equipment to do that or even a plastic water bottle. And so I'm gonna close on your logo, Soul Health Nexus. Like, you know, what if we reduced our fossil carbon emissions? Remember that's this blue arrow that you guys vastly overestimated, but it's still a problem because it's fundamentally unbalanced. Are you with me? And we also engaged in practices that drew carbon dioxide from the air and parked it durably. Remember, you got to meet ALPO criteria in soils. Like that's my hope. And that's how every time I look at your beautiful logo, I'm going to superimpose these two arrows in there, right? How do we shrink the fossil carbon emissions associated with ag? And then how do we also do cool things to sort of scrub more CO2 out of the air? Um, last three slides. Um, I did a postdoc at Arizona State. That's actually a little bit drier than Montana. And the only way that we got through with our two small kids is the public pool system. I mean, amazing public school, uh, public pool system, right? So you go into these pools and then I don't need to tell you, but the combination of small kids, much smaller than Cooper here um, and public pools means sometimes they kids have accidents, right? You just do the math. Like these kids are gonna have little accidents. Either they're gonna pee in the pool or they're gonna drop a turd. I mean, that's a technical term, right? In the pool. So I don't know if you guys have been around these public pools, but I just wanted to make it, bring it all full circle. Like you gotta fish that turd out and then they shot chlorinate it. And then 30 minutes later, like to the second, everybody is like cannonballing back into the pool. So this all came together for me. And I, and I really am putting this slide in here for this one quote. So a guy in April wrote, a blog called Clean Up on Isle Earth. And I don't expect any of you on the call to be able to see the fine print here. But he wrote, you know what? There has never been a better time to start a carbon removal company. And he wrote, when you only have one swimming pool, right? And that's a metaphor for our atmosphere. You got to fish out the turds already floating <laughs> around while simultaneously convincing people to stop dropping new turds, right? And really that's a plea to all of you on this call to just think most creatively because I learned so much from every producer I meet. Like we need to be more creative about reducing fossil carbon emissions. And I feel like that should count for helping soil be part of the solution and scrubbing more CO2 out. And that's all I got. Wow, I'm tired, I'm out of breath. <laughs> Thanks, thanks a lot, Tony. I really appreciate your your comments. So the fishing out the turd is the new tagline for for uh, soil health. Uh, well, you got to be careful. Like some people would say, <laughs> that is uh, not very polite. What is wrong with yeah, you? Yeah. So so you you had a slide in there talking about you know some of the soil health practices. Uh, you know that you know we're trying to trying to get around some take homes, you know, how farmers can kind of move the le needle on, on their production practices, you know, reducing the fuel use, reducing passes with, are there any other things that, that, that you suggest uh, that, that farmers, producers can do to kind of, you know, we always like to sequester carbon in the soil because increased, you know, soil organic matter usually increases the water holding capacity and on down the line. Any, any thoughts, comments? 
Yeah, so I prepped one slide, and, and I don't know if this will show up exactly um, for you guys, but um, like, I, I just love this um, graphic. It's from, I don't know, 1934, it looks. And I don't know, can you guys see that? It should say fighting the drought, and it's basically old black and white images. Yeah, from yeah we got that. Popular mechanics. So, you know, to your point, like one of the things that I've always been struck by when I drive around, you know, at least the northern Rockies, the northern mountain front or the northern Great Plains is the number of homesteads, right? Original homesteads that are surrounded by what people call shelter belts, right? And like, I mean, how crazy is this? But I'm pretty sure that shelter belt that they're sort of showing diagrammatically on the left, you know, with this little map is running to a lot of your member states. This shelter belt was intended to be 100 miles wide and 1,000 miles long. And so one of the things about this shelter belt that I've been thinking a lot more about is it's obviously a dust trap, right? And so that's why they got planted maybe 100 years ago all across at least my part of the world, you know, Montana, up here in the upper Missouri headwaters. Um, but it's not just a dust trap. It's also a snow trap. And I guess one of the recommendations is just to look at your landscape and ask the question, what is it that I can do to make my soil slightly moister? And, and by moister, I mean, I don't wanna be growing cattails, right? If you guys are corn and soybean country, we're wheat country mostly, some lentils, obviously a lot of cow, but like, I don't want it to be so wet that it's gonna grow cattails like a traditional wetland, but I want it to be a little tiny bit wetter and the reason for that is that I have this theory that, you know, which soils hold the most organic matter? Well, they're wetland soils. So can we nudge things along? Obviously, I'm interested in shelter belts because of their potential to trap snow. Um, and, and because that's going to be really all the water that we get to work with as the West continues to dry out or go through drought. So I'm not sure if that answers your question exactly, yeah. Paul, but like yeah. one of the things that I've been really struggling with, with this new project that we got, new five-year project is looking at the landscape and saying, hmm, I bet you you're clayier down there. So you will hold water better. How can I build some snow fencing or what some people are calling in our part of the world, because obviously we're a heads, headwater state is what some people are calling beaver mimicry in these little creeks and stuff. So I hope that helps. Okay, very good. Thank you. And again, thank you so much for, for uh, joining us today. I really appreciate uh, you sharing your information and your research with us. Uh, next uh, next uh, month, we're going to have Dr. Anna Cates from uh, Minnesota, University of Minnesota. Uh, she's going to be our presenter. But for now, uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we're going to be able to go into chat rooms now or for uh, breakout rooms for uh, for discussions, further discussion. Uh, Tony, you can pick the one you want to go to. Uh, and if you can give us the cue to go to and we can pick and uh, thanks again and stay on or as long or as little as you'd like into your discussion room. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Sure thing. I just opened up the uh, breakout room. So you should be able to go down to your kind of uh, icons at the bottom and click out breakout rooms. And then you can join, choose the group that uh, you'd like to join. We have educator, researcher, agency, student, or producer. Could I answer folks joining? So it looks like those options are available, folks. Hey, Ann, I'm going to run. Hi, Sarah. Sorry. What was that? I, I went to a breakout room. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to run. Okay. Um, okay.